how to make 100% a year. So this was a uh, question that I got from a commenter and I actually told me you can make 50% a year and they thought it was quite high. And 100% though is actually reasonable too. But what they were more concerned about though was how can I do this with a full-time job and how can I do this without having to analyze the markets? So we're gonna talk about that today. How can we actually do this without having to analyze markets? That means be non-directional. That means that we don't need to bet whether the markets are gonna go up or down. We can actually trade in a way where we are non-directional, where regardless of whether markets go higher or lower, we make money. And so that's the first thing that I wanna talk about. And also, it only takes a couple of minutes to do. But first, I wanna talk about portfolio construction. So what sort of portfolio construction are we using? Well. The portfolio construction that this requires is what we call a barbell portfolio. A barbell portfolio is where you put say 20 or 15% really high risk assets and they put like an 80 or 85% allocation of very low risk assets. Worst case scenario, you lose that 15 or 20%, right? So that's the thing right there, is that a barbell portfolio outperforms a medium risk or portfolio. And um, the person who popularized this portfolio was actually Nassim Taleb. He went out and he looked at this and he said that if I were to just put a small portion of my portfolio in very high risk assets, I would do uh, better than if I put all of my portfolio in medium risk assets. So that's the first thing we want to remember. So when we're doing this short premium barbell portfolio, I'm going to walk you guys through some trades and what you guys need to watch out for. Um, if we're doing this sort of a portfolio, what we're going to do is that we're going to keep a large cash pile and a large pile of inflation hedges. So large cash pile and then along with that maybe some iVol or something like that. Uh, that's, that acts like an inflation hedge, right? We're going to put a large amount right there. We're going to take a very small amount like 10 or 15% of our portfolio and then just take 10 or 15% and then put it in something that is very high risk. And in that case, it's going to be short premium strategies. If you guys don't know what short premium strategies mean, it basically means selling options. If you guys don't know what that is, link in the description below. We got a whole video um, talking about selling options. Um, uh, I'll actually link it to a playlist with a bunch of videos that talks about what options are, um, different strategies, some of which we're actually going to be using today. So what does short premium really mean? Well, short premium means that you are selling options. When you're selling options, you're shorting volatility and volatility is asymmetrical. It's a lot different than price, right? Price is very 50-50. That's why I really don't like trading price alone. Whenever you trade price purely off direction, you're, you're doing this 50-50 bet. Either the price goes up or the price goes down, right? It's like a big 50-50 bet. Whenever you have something like volatility, volatility has a implied volatility risk premium. And that means that it tends to overstate itself. So if I'm expecting volatility of 10, I said only get a volatility of five. So I can actually sell that volatility through options and I can make money based off of that. So it's a lot more asymmetrical. Now this does come with the risk, but if you do a risk defined, you risk a small percent of your portfolio, you'll be good. So that's the first thing you wanna do. How are we gonna do this? Well, basically selling options works like this. You could say, you know, the stock is at 100 right now and then I can bet basically it's gonna stay between 100 and 150. And as long as it stays between 100 or excuse me, 50 and 150. So if, this, so if the stock price is in the middle at 100, I can say, okay, as long as it stays between 50 and 150, I'm gonna make money, right? So you really don't need to pick, okay, is it gonna go up? Is it gonna go down? You just put it inside a range. So it's a neutral trading strategy. Now, of course, you can't have too much volatility where it goes above 150 or below 50, but I'm gonna tell you guys how you guys can actually spot implied volatility risk premium how you can actually spot overpriced volatility and sell it. And you can put yourself in a position where maybe the stock goes from 100 to like 99, to like 101, to like 98, to 100, to 101, right? It's seen as a very small range. But you're able to sell all the way down to 50 and all the way up to 150 and bet that it's gonna stay inside that range. And as long as it stays inside the range, you make money. And you put it inside a very wide range that is way overpriced. So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. So now that we already understand barbell investing, um, the concept of it. Now we're going to apply it to short premium. And if you guys don't know anything basic about options or what they are, link in the description below. I'm going to give you the same playlist that I gave that commenter. It's a pretty good playlist talking about the basics of options. Um, but I'm going to talk about more of the advanced things with volatility and such. And so how can you actually spot overpriced volatility 
and you don't need to be directional, right? You don't need to bring your opinion into it. You don't need to know whether it's going to be upside volatility and stock's going to go up or the stock's going to go down, right? You just look at it. You look at the criteria and you go through and you say, great, okay, the volatility is overpriced. I'm going to risk, and usually on each uh, trade, you're going to risk 2% of your portfolio, risk 2% of your portfolio, put the trade on. And usually the way non-directional trades work is that you just put inside a range. So if the stock's at 100, you say it's going to stay between 50 and 150. And as long as it does, then you make money, right? And so you just go where the overpriced volatility is. So I'm going to talk about that today. Let's hop onto the computer and actually go over some example trades of how to do this. And then afterwards, I'm going to go over the criteria for what you need for these sorts of trades. Okay, everybody. So I got those example trades I said I would. But first, before I get into that, I want to go over some simpler things like how volatility impacts options, implied volatility distribution, um, criteria for getting in trades, how to find implied volatility risk premium, things like beta curves, um, and then how we manage winning trades and what we do with losing trades. So I want to go over that first um, before I even get into the specific trade. So the first thing is how volatility impacts options. So all an option is, that an option is just the right to buy or sell um, some stock, right? So let's say the stock right now, um, we got fill in the blank stock that is at $100. Uh, this can be any imaginary stock, right? And then I give someone, it's basically like an insurance contract in a sense, and you can speculate with it. You can actually use it as a hedge or like insurance, and or you can uh, use it for income. And so let's say that I sell an option and someone else buys it for me, uh, from me because they own the stock. It's at $100 right now, and they're worried that the market's going to crash. It's going to go all the way down to 50 so then $90. I sell them the put option, and so now I'm giving them the right to sell me their stock at $90. If the stock is just a little volatile like this, and it doesn't move a lot, moves from like 99 to 101, then this insurance contract right here won't cost a lot of money because the probability of it touching that is not a lot. But once you have a very volatile stock that moves like this between 80 and 120 on a consistent basis, then you have a stock um, because it's so volatile, the insurance contract is going to cost a lot more. And so that's really what an option is. You know, it's just an insurance contract at the end of the day. And that's that's how it's going to work if you sell the option. So the higher the volatility, the more the option costs. That's just, you know, that's a simple thing right there. That's what options are built off of. Options are built off of intrinsic plus extrinsic value. Well, if the option is not in the money. Um, in this case, it's not. It would have to be above $100 to be in the money. It has no intrinsic value. Well, what's the rest of the value built off? It's built off of time value, right? If I go out and I buy car insurance um, for the next month, right, I have a month of time value that I am paying the insurer to insure my car, right? It is time value. That's all it is. And the more volatility in the stock, the more that time value will cost because the more risk to the person who is selling the option, right? So that's a simple concept to get across right there, but you gotta understand that uh, to go forward from here. And again, um, if you guys don't know a lot about this, link in the description below, I have linked um, some basic option stuff down there where uh, I link Tasty Trades playlist that goes over options for beginners and starts with basic options and um, talks about what options are just from the foundational level. So you got to understand that right there, how volatility relates to all that. Implied volatility distribution. So when we think of distribution, we likely think of like a bell curve, right? Think of a bell curve like this. And everything is distributed along this bell curve where 50% is right here and the 50% is right here. And this is what we call a normal or Gaussian distribution, right? where things are distributed like this in a more normal sense. Stock prices are similar to this, somewhat similar, but they have fat tails. And so they're distributed like this. But they're still distributed with 50% of prices right here and 50% of prices right here. Now, as I had said earlier, volatility is a bit different, and you can find an edge in volatility and actually trade it, um, without knowing anything about what's going to happen in direction, just based off of this. So that's how price works. Price, even though it has fat tails, it is still normally distributed in the sense that it has the same amount of distribution on the left tail as it does on the right tail. But let me show you what volatility looks like. 
So I'm going to use the VIX. Now the VIX is just, you can actually type that in as a ticker symbol over here. VIX is a volatility um, is a volatility index um, that measures implied volatility on the S&P 500. Goes out about um, to the front month, about 30 days out, right? It, it it's just a measure of implied volatility on the S&P 500, and that's exactly what it does. That's what the VIX does, right? And so when we look at the distribution for the VIX, though, it's very different. Volatility works very, very different on a distribution basis. So one thing you gotta remember about volatility before we get into any of this, is that volatility is different from price. Volatility mean reverts, right? Price is very, um, price does not mean revert. Price can keep on going higher and higher and higher, it can keep on going lower and lower and lower. Volatility tends to mean revert. And I can actually show you this on the VIX. Implied volatility will mean revert, and we can actually see this on a long-term chart of the VIX. If I actually go out a one-month chart, we actually go back, I can probably go back further on a six-month chart. Let's try a three-month chart. What do we see? We see that volatility comes up, and then it comes down, comes up, comes down. And it sees low for a while, and then it comes up, spikes, and then it comes down. It's a mean reverting asset. It always goes back to its average. The average for the VIX is about 20. This is very different from price. It's a completely different mechanism. And so because it's variable, mean reverse, because it goes back to its average, it's very different from the way um, something like price would work. And this is why it's a nice special vehicle to trade, but it's also an easier vehicle to trade because you know what's going to happen long term to it. And it has, um, in the shorter term, it is harder to trade, but in the longer term, you know that it always tends to mean revert. And you know that it doesn't just go up forever, it eventually comes down. And these things tend to mean revert. So it comes up, comes down, comes up, comes down, comes up, comes down, right? Does that again and again and again. And so it tends to mean revert. But on the distribution, it's very interesting to see this. So here's what the distribution looks like for the VIX. This right here is going to be 20. The average for the VIX is 20. But look at what I did right here. You have a situation where I'm going to put that right there. I'm going to Put that down there. So you have a situation when you look at this distribution curve where the biggest thing that you notice is that a vast majority of the volatility is on the left tail. So a vast majority of the distribution is on the left tail. But on the left tail, you have low volatility, and so you have volatility that might only be 10% below its average, but and it might take a couple of vol um, a couple of days of volatility that's 10 days 10% uh, below its average, but then all it takes is one day of volatility that's hundreds of percent above its average, all the way right here on this fat tail distribution um, of the distribution curve, where it offsets the amount that is down. And so that's the interesting thing. It is not a normal distribution. This is where you start to find things like edges, right? You can actually find an edge when trading volatility because I'm gonna draw another line right here. And this is an interesting thing that not many people talk about. Um, it is basic statistics, but just not many people connect um, basic statistics like this to finance. And so the average VIX or the mean is 20, but the median VIX is actually 17. How is that? Because if VIX stays so low for so long, right here, if we actually look right here at this chart, the VIX stays so low for so long right here that the median of the VIX is actually below its average. But because all it takes is just takes to offset those days where the VIX is below its average by say five or 10%, all it takes is that it takes a day where the VIX is above its average four or 500% to offset those days where the VIX is below its average, say five or 10%, right? And so that's why we see that all it takes is these couple of big crashes where there's a massive spike in volatility, massive spike in volatility, and all it does is that it offsets these little times where it's below. Um, the average. And so it's a mean reverting asset. And on top of that, what we know is that it has these fat tails on the right uh, side of the distribution, but most of the distribution is actually on the left side 
um, of the distribution curve. So it's a very weird looking curve. We can take advantage of this. So what we know is that whenever you sell an option, you are short volatility. And whenever you buy an option, you are long volatility. Well, this gives you an edge when you're selling options and you're managing your winners correctly. The reason it gives you an edge is because when volatility is below its average, it can stay there for years and years and years, right? So let me actually put this line right here. So average volatility, about right there, right? If we actually look at volatility, it stays below its average. It did spike up a little bit, but then it came right back down. Spiked up, you know, came right to its average, but then it came right back down, right? And then right here, it actually went fairly high above its average. I could call that a high volatility at time. And then it came right back down, right? And so it creates a situation where what we're seeing is that volatility can stay low for years and years and years. But once volatility spikes, it comes back down within weeks. And we actually saw this very recently. We saw volatility spike and within weeks it came right back down. So this is another interesting thing right here. Volatility contracts about two times more than it expands. The reason it does that is because the VIX has this abnormal distribution and you can take advantage of this distribution curve. So now we know volatility mean reverts, but it's a lot harder to bet that volatility will go higher because volatility can spend a very long time below its average because we know the historical uh, way the distribution curve works, where the median is below the mean because so much is piled onto the left tail, where the VIX spends so much of its time, volatility spends so much time below its average, but it might only be below its average by like five or 10%, but it spends so much, uh, where it spends so little time above its average, but when it is above its average, it's three or four hundred percent above its average. And so even though it might only be as above its average for say one day, um, it might be above its average by like 400%. And even though it's below its average for another say 100 days, when it is below its average, it's below its average by 10 or uh, 15, maybe 20%, right? Not um, a full 400%. And of course, volatility can't go negative, right? You can't have negative volatility. And so the mechanism of volatility is such that it, the volatility and volatility is so high where you can have a 400% move. But of course, you can't go down more than four. Uh, you can't go down 400%. You can't go negative, right, with volatility. But you can go up for 400%. And so it creates these fat tails of distribution. And so a lot of basic statistics right here. Um, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you can just review some basic statistics. All this really just distribution curves. But what you're doing is you're applying basic statistics to finance. That's really what it is, quantitative finance at the end of the day. And it's pretty simple stuff. Um, in the beginning, it might seem hard and does have a steep learning curve, but it, at the end of the day, this is pretty simple um, grade school type um, stuff that you learn about distribution and such. But yes, fat tail distributions right here, where to have an average of 20, all you need is that you need one day where the VIX or vol implied volatility is all the way up at 100, and then you need another 50 days where it's down at 18 or 17, and all of it equals out to 20. And it's all it takes is that one day that's way, way above its average with that fat tail right there that you keep on pointing to, where all it takes is that one day to revert to hit 20, and that's why the mean uh, is... 20 but the median is 17 and you can actually make a profit off of that so now we know volatility implied volatility mean reverts and we also know that it is easier to sell options when implied volatility is high but it's very hard to buy options when implied volatility is low and we know that because implied volatility can, does not stay high for a very long period of time as we saw right here implied volatility can stay low for years and years and years Right? It spiked up a little bit, but then came right back down. Spiked up a little bit, but then came back down. And it stayed below its average for such a long time. So it's very easy to go into areas of high implied volatility and short the volatility um, through options. You can do it through futures. There's so many different ways to do it. I'm going to show you two um, specific trades, but I mean, there's, there's a gajillion different ways to do it, right? And so you can short the volatility, and there is quite literally an edge to that. Um, and many people use the word edge and they just throw it around when there really is not an edge, but right here there is quite literally 
um, an edge if used properly. There is an edge, and that is that the abnormal distribution curve of volatility makes it so that when volatility is high, it mean reverts lower very quickly, but when volatility is below its average, it does not mean revert higher very quickly. Because not below, because volatility can stay for long periods of time below its average, because when it is below its average, it's not below its average a lot. So hopefully you guys get the idea right there. If not, again, what we're really talking about right here is that we're applying basic statistics, like grade school statistics that everybody learned um, to finance. That's really what it is. So that's implied volatility distribution. So what are the criteria for trades? Implied volatility rank. So how do we know that something's about above its average implied volatility? Well, there's something called implied volatility rank because everything trades at a normal uh, implied volatility that's different from everything else. So treasury bonds normally have a very low volatility. So if a treasury bond, if um, a T-bill has a volatility of say three, that's considered a pretty high volatility. But if stocks have a volatility of 10, that is considered a super duper low volatility, even for the overall index, not just for single stocks, which tend to have a higher volatility due to single stock risk that you don't have inside the index because the index is diversified. Um, and then something like oil, oil got up to 450 volatility. So how do we actually know whether volatility um, relative to itself on a product is actually high? And the way that we know this is that we use implied volatility rank. Implied volatility rank goes back one year and then it ranks the whole entire implied volatility. The average vol implied volatility over the uh, last one year will be an implied volatility rank of 50. So you know that whenever it's above 50, it's above its average. And then when it's well above 50, it gives you a good opportunity. How can you find a screener for that? Well, I actually have a screener right here that I have saved. It's actually this one right here. And so this is what it looks like right here. And link, into this, uh, link in the description below for this right here. And basically right here, you can go right here and you can put any and then any right here. And I can go through and I can say, okay, I want elevated implied volatility ring. I want volatility up, right? It gives you a lot of different things you can do. You can say, I want common shares. I want ETFs. I want anything. Um, and, it, and it gives you overall um, a great amount of things you can do. And this is for stocks. Um, I wish they had something like this for bonds and such, but they don't. Uh, but stocks are generally, stocks and ETFs are the most common and liquidly traded uh, product out there uh, that most people also understand how to trade. So that's what IVR is. You need liquidity. Of course, liquidity, that's a simple concept to understand. All liquidity is that you got a lot of buyers, you got a lot of sellers. And so you can always, you get these um, bid ass spreads that are very tight and that will stay tight. You have a deep market and a tight market and you want that, right? That's all liquidity is. Implied volatility term structure, uh, this just means this is related to finding a good strategy. But you can actually search up VIX futures. And when you search up VIX futures, what you're finding is the implied volatility term structure. So implied volatility is just a future expectation for volatility, right? Um, based off of the options prices. So what, what implied volatility term structure measures is implied volatility term structure goes out and it says, okay, one month from now, it goes out and basically says, I can actually draw this out. It says, okay, one month from now, the expectation for volatility is 20 on the S&P 500. Two months from now, the expectation for volatility is 25. Three months from now, it is 30. Um, and then four months from now, it's 35, right? Something like that. And so it actually gives you this curve or this term structure for volatility. So you can actually see implied volatility stacked against itself. Um, right here, we have implied volatility and we can see that's pretty much flat, implied volatility term structure. But these are the futures, these are VIX futures. And we can pretty much see that they're all flat right now where they were last traded. But what you do with implied volatility term structure is that you can see what the term structure looks like. So you can see, okay, volatility right now is really high, the VIX is all the way up at 80, and um, implied volatility being priced in a month from now is 80. And then implied volatility being priced in two months from now is 70, and then 60, and then 50, 40, 30, 20, and then 20, 20, 20, because 20 is its average. And, it, and the market's not stupid. The market understands the same thing you do. It understands the mean reversion, right? And so prices is in. And that's why we have to take that into account to our strategies. We get this little curve right here, what we refer to as the volatility curve, that takes all that term structure into account.
Uh, so the market's not stupid. It prices in the uh, mean reversion of volatility into the futures contracts and into future options prices. But we can take that into account in our strategies and be smart with that too. Okay, theta, or well, how to find applied volatility risk premium. Let's go over that first. So how do we find applied volatility risk premium? Um, there are actually a couple of ways of doing this. First off, you can use it on a relative basis. So what we call volatility variance. With volatility variance, what it really is, is that Facebook and Twitter, for example, I can say Facebook and Twitter are very similar cash flows, and Facebook and Twitter are also very similar companies, and they are both in the same sector, and so hypothetically, um, their profitability should be very similar, and the volatility in their profitability should be very similar. And why do we have volatility in stock prices? Well, the reason a stock price is just based off the amount of earnings that company makes. The whole reason they have volatility in stock prices is because you have volatility in the earnings of that particular company. And so if, the, if you suspect that the volatility in Twitter's earnings are the same as the volatility in Facebook's earnings, then they should have the same amount of implied volatility. But right now, we, see, we could see a situation where Facebook has really high implied volatility and Twitter has really low implied volatility. And so... Uh, relative to each other so you can actually buy volatility on Twitter and then you can sell volatility on Facebook so that's actually something you can do on a variance basis and other time you find this and there are many different scenarios where you find this um, another time that you might find this for example would be like on the Hong Kong US dollar the Hong Kong US dollar um, are completely pegged meaning that the price is fixed to a certain amount so what you can actually do is, even though the price is fixed to a certain amount, what, what that means is basically the price is fixed to a certain amount. The price just goes like this, and it cannot move out of that range that it has um, with this fixed pegging. And so because of this, you can sell some options up here, and you can sell some options down here. And the reason these options have value, though, is because people are worried that one day this Hong Kong US dollar peg will break. But they've been worrying about that now for years and years and years. And you could have just sold options for years and years and years and you could have made money. Now, of course, you had the risk that the peg was going to break and that risk could have played out. But that risk is way, way overstated. There's way too much of a risk premium being added to that risk. And what you can do is you can sell an option and then buy an option right here. So you can actually sell an option, but then you can buy some insurance just in case if you're worried. So now you have your losses limited right there to the spread. Same thing right here, it's risk defined to that spread. And you can do that. But the amount you would have made so far over the last couple of years far surpassed, far, far, far surpassed the risk that the Hong Kong US dollar peg actually breaks. And basically the price never even traded to that amount on the upside or on the downside. And so you got opportunities like that. But there are many, many different opportunities where you find implied volatility risk premium where you just say, okay, the risk the market is just so scared that it's pricing is such a big risk, but I just don't see that sort of a risk. Um, and you can do that straight up with uh, volatility trades like that. You can do that with pairs trades where you buy vol on one instrument, you buy, uh, sell on another, there's volatility variance, right? There's so many different ways to do this. And so that's how you do that theta curve. Many people don't understand it. Many people know, that, of course, an option has theta, right? Theta is just time decay. Over time, an option loses value because it has an expiration period. So if because an option has an expiration period, um, over time it loses value. But many people think, okay, this option um, that costs ten dollars expires in five days, so it's going to lose top two dollars every single day. But they don't understand that options are not linear. They don't just lose two dollars every single day. You actually have a situation where that ten dollar option will lose thirty cents and go nine dollars seventy cents. So it's going to lose seventy cents. It's going to go nine dollars, and from there it's going to go to eight dollars, and from there it's going to go to uh, like five dollars and from there it's going to go to zero dollars. So it's going to exponentially lose the money. So at the money options are like this where two weeks two weeks expiration and at the money option will start losing massive amounts of money and it will exponentially lose money until expiration. How does it work for a one, how does it work for a one standard deviation to a half a standard deviation, delta 16 to a delta 30, negative delta 16 to a negative delta 30 option? The way that it works is that you actually have something that is going to work like this, where 45 days um, 
to expiration is when the option loses the most value. And actually, the theta decay actually starts to slow down about one week to expiration. So that, that's what we have right there. And then same thing, probably should have made this bigger right here, but one week, and this would be for options that are trading two standard deviation, one and a half standard deviations. So that would be your five delta to 10 delta or negative five delta to negative 10 delta. They start losing a vast majority of their um, time decay or their extrinsic value about eight weeks out in expiration. And so you can attack the theta decay. You, you don't have to hold your options till expiration. You don't have to sell an option 60 days to expiration and hold it for 60 days. You can sell 60 days to expiration and then within a week you can take it off and you can take it off for like 25% profit or 50% profit, right? You can make a lot in a very short amount of time and just manage it. And so you gotta understand the theta curve though. You gotta attack the right part of the theta curve. And the theta curve will also change based on implied volatility uh, term structure. If volatility is really, really high, um, implied volatility term structure tends to be in backwardation, so everything tends to be closer to expiration. And instead of like instead of eight weeks, it might be like seven weeks, and sometimes like nine weeks. But this is a good rough outline right here. Okay, so managing winning trades. So let me actually go over some of the trades today. First trade, I got both these trades on Facebook, and that's just the underlying I chose. And so. On both of these trades, um, they're both non-directional. So you don't need to guess whether the stock will go up or down. It is non-directional, meaning that you can, will try to make money no matter the direction. I'm actually going to show you guys a risk graph for these uh, trades right here. This is the first one right here. As you can see, it's, it's purely non-directional. It doesn't depend on direction. It just depends on it staying neutral within a certain amount of range. And so as long as Facebook stays between $170 and $280, I make money. So all it has to do is stay within this range and you can make money. And unlike buying a stock or shorting stock, every tick that you buy a stock and it goes down, you start losing money. Right here, it works a lot better though. Um, you don't lose money in the same way. And so right here, um, you're, you're basically putting the stock inside a range. You're saying as long as it stays inside this range, I'm going to make money. And that's why the payoff diagram looks like this, and you don't start losing money until it crosses over. And as long as it stays inside the range, you make money, and you can manage this before expiration. Another one I got, this is a far more shorter term, a bit more speculative because it's cheaper, but at the same time, um, you're risking a very small amount to make a lot on this trade versus the other one. Um, this is a calendar spread. Again, these are all non-directional, right? You can look at the risk graph. The risk graph for this does not have any direction on No directional skew. Same way, no directional skew right here. Same, um, no matter whether it's to the upside or to the downside. It's uh, aiming to make money um, it, as long as it stays inside the range. And so right here on the calendar spread, this is a calendar spread right here. Uh, this is where you buy option further. I'll sell an option closer to expiration on it. We can see that we have a sort of a trade structure right here where as long as the price stays um, above above 215 to 252.5 over the next one week you will make money this is a far shorter term trade and so over here your range is a lot smaller right your range is going to be 252.5 right there on the upside and on the downside The downside we had about 215 ish. So 215 on the downside. There we go. So as long as it stays inside this range. Now, of course, for this one, it's very close to expiration. You just need it to stay inside this range for a week. And that's when it actually expires within a week. Um, the short strikes expire. You can actually manage this within like two or three days. And so it's actually a pretty good range for just two or three days. Uh, period. And this is actually a weekly chart. We can go down to a daily chart. And for a daily chart, it's two or three days. So you need to see inside this range, which is very high 
or probability of happening. So you want to manage your winners and you want to give your losers duration. So that means give losers time to work out and you want to take the winners off the table because if I got tails five times in a row, if I got tails the first time, then the second time, then the third time, then the fourth time, then the fifth time, then my probability of getting heads the sixth time is very, very high, which is why your winning trades could actually turn into losing trades if you don't manage them quick enough. And so it's just, the, the statistics say you want to manage your winning trades. So manage credit spreads at 50% of max profits. That would be the iron condor that I showed you. Um, that would be this trade right here. Uh, this trade right here, calendar spread, we want to go ahead and manage that at 10% of max profit. Again, uh, calendar spreads are a bit more speculative, usually use shorter term. 10% um, of max profit for that one, just because it's a lot more speculative. So um, you want to manage that one quicker. What do we do for losing trades? Give losers, give losing trades duration. So for iron condors, roll the untested side, and if needed, roll to the next expiration. So that means that the stock starts to come down, and this had a larger range right here. But if it starts to come down, say it starts to come down, um, all the way down here in the market starts to crash, what do, what do I do? I take this side that's winning, the untested side, and then I roll it down. And then if the market keeps on crashing lower, and then I roll it down. And so that's all I do right there. Um, where if the market starts to crash from here, I then just take this up here, roll it down, and if it crashes further, all I do again, roll it down, and then if it crashes further from here, all I do with this call is I'd roll it down, and I just do that until it reaches a strike. And then what I do is I take this, and then I buy it back, it would be more expensive, but then I roll it down, uh, down in strike, but then out in expiration. So roll it down in strike, but out in expiration, give myself some more time to win. And then while this call spread is shorter uh, duration expiration, and I can keep on rolling it down. So that's what you want to do if it doesn't work with you for an iron condor. Calendar spreads though, um, you just want to roll them to next expiration. There's not much you can do with the calendar spread when it comes to um, whether whether you want to roll this because as I said some more speculative trade this trade is only going to cost you half a percent of the stock price half a percent of the stock price um I can actually check right here for the debit yep half a percent of the stock price right here and so it is a more speculative trade though because you're getting in for 155 and you have a possibility of making somewhere close to six hundred dollars so it is far more speculative but because of that, you do have your downsides to that, which is that you can't as easily um, roll things like you can. So you just roll it to the next expiration if you want to keep it going. Other than that, um, I will wrap this up right here. Let's go back and um, wrap everything up that we talked about. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you guys want more of these trades, I do do longer term uh, trades on this channel and talk about what's going to happen more longer term on this channel. Uh, if you guys want shorter term trades or trades also that are more advanced or more directional, I tried to keep it easy in this video. I made all the trades neutral or non-directional or delta neutral, right? Where we're not trying to pick whether the stock goes up or down. But if you guys do want trades where we actually discuss whether it should go up or down or whether it's going to go up a certain amount or with a certain amount of volatility and you want to bring in a lot more like theta, vega, uh, discussion about delta, longer term trades with leaps, where we actually make money off of what's going on with risk-free rates. That's a row right there, right? All these different things. I do have an options trading advisory. Uh, currently giving a free trial of that. Link in the description below. And also, if you guys don't know the basics of options, I'm going to link to a Tasty Trade playlist, the same one that I sent that commenter. Link in the description below to that. And that's going to explain to you the basics of options. Other than that, everybody, if you guys have any questions, again, drop them in the comment section below. Uh, I would love to hear feedback. You guys find me on Facebook, you guys find me on StockTwits, uh, TradingView, and again, I'm on Substack uh, with that trading advisory that I have. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.